Hey my friend, wouldn't it be amazing to have more energy? I talked to my dear friend and energy expert, Sean Wells, on how you can create more energy in your body. Energy is the basis for a healthy body that can resist the damage that ages us. So be sure to check out this amazing interview with a top expert on energy. Hello, my friend. Welcome back to the Anti-Aging Hacks Podcast. Today, I have a very special guest, my friend, Sean Wells, who is the world's leading nutritional biochemist and expert on health optimization. He's formulated over 500 supplements, food, beverages, and cosmeceuticals, and patented 10 novel ingredients, and is now known as the ingredientologist, the scientist of ingredients. He has counseled thousands of people on innovative health solutions such as keto, paleo, fasting, and supplements a lot of which we'll get into in this interview. As a world-renowned thought leader in mitochondrial health, he has been paid to speak on five different continents. His insights have been prominently featured in documentaries, nationally syndicated radio programs, and regularly on morning television. His new book, The Energy Formula, is a guide meant to bring you out of the black hole of fatigue, depression, and weight challenges, and into a more passionate, energized, and vibrant life now. With that said, Sean, welcome to the Anti-Aging Hacks Show. Dude, thank you for having me on. I'm I'm a huge Faraz Khan fan. I, I love thank, you, brother. Thank you, brother. Likewise, and you've been on the show before. But for people that don't know you, Sean, uh, I want to get you get into your background a little bit. But before that, you've spent months, probably years, actually, writing your new book called The Energy Formula, which I've been reading over the last couple of days. And let me tell you, it's less of a book that you read once and, and more of a book that you go back to over and over because it, it contains more than just energy. It's almost like the foundations for how you should live your life. And so I'm super excited to have you to talk about it. But first, let's go into your background and how you got excited or got into health and wellness in general. Oh, yeah, for sure. So uh, like you said, um, you know, you mentioned all the biochemists, registered dietitian, certified sports nutritionist, and formulator. How I got into that was I grew up a junk food junkie. I grew up because I was bullied and abused and and had a a tough time growing up and very little self-esteem, very little self-love, really was incapable of of giving love as a result and a lot of body dysmorphia, a lot of uh, disordered eating, and eventually like that, that junk food junkie and morbid obesity led to anorexia and I struggled with depression and suicidal thoughts so much of my life, but food and my body shape was a huge factor. And there came a point when I was going to business school, which everyone told me, hey, Sean, that's what you need to go do. So I was like, uh, okay, I'll just go to business school. And it has served me well, but I didn't know what I was going to do at that point. And I started working out in between my sophomore and junior year. I, read cool books like this Dr. Uh, Colgan's book on optimum sports nutrition with GH uh, amino acid stacks and um, really cool stuff. He was working with Olympic athletes and I was going into GNCs and spending four or five hours in there like people do bookstores, just reading labels. (laughs) I was addicted to going in GNCs and uh, reading all these muscle magazines, Ironman, muscular development. And I started using creatine and protein and glutamine and all these ingredients. Some of them worked great. Some of them probably didn't work at all, but I was addicted to all of it. My body was changing. I was going up like dumbbells every time I went, you know, to the gym and felt like I was making tons of progress. People were starting to talk to me and acknowledge me. I didn't feel like I was disappearing in the crowd and I was just, you know, the sad fat boy. Girls were uh, noticing you again. Yeah, man. I mean, yeah, not tons, but I was doing okay, you know, (laughs) better than before. And, uh, and I ended up going to my doctor to get my physical and he noticed the changes. And and I started talking to him about all my excitement with these ingredients and how I could see like how cool it was to be a formulator. And there was this one guy, Dr. Marv Hoyer, that was with muscle tech and he'd wear lab coats in these ads and he was a formulator. Mm-hmm. And I was like, man, this could be like a real thing. And I was just talking to this doctor about this and I thought he was going to laugh at the whole thing. And instead he drew out this lifeline in between 20 and 80 and said, why not be happy between here and here? Wow. And I was like, whoa, oh, okay. 
-hmm. I think he just gave me permission to go pursue my passion. And I didn't even know that was my passion until he made it clear to me. And so I was like, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to finish up business school. I'm going to somehow get all these prereqs I need, which I didn't realize how much there was going to be. And then I'm going to get into my dream school at Chapel Hill to get my master's and be a registered dietitian and be a biochemist and then maybe be a formulator at some point. And knowing that this is all going to probably take about 10 years to accomplish. And I was like, I don't care. It just all makes sense now. He just gave me my purpose and my passion. And I'm someone that has dealt with like a lot of health struggles and, and they continued. And, uh, but when I got to UNC Greensboro, my parents were down in North Carolina and I wanted to go in state school and I needed what would be two years of prereqs, 26 credit hours a semester of labs and all the sciences. I was like, well, I just, I got to fit it in. I'm going to do the max and then I can get into Chapel Hill as quickly as possible. Cause I had to do biochemistries and anatomies and physiologies and all these all organic chem, all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And I ended up going into the guidance counselor at UNCG and I told him about my dream of being a formulator and how I was going to take all these classes. And he laughed at me and he told me that uh, you're a business student, you'll fail and you'll fail miserably Jeez. and you're not even in that good of shape. And I left there crying, thinking like this dream is now dead. Mm-hmm. It's not achievable. I spent the last two years believing it to be true and on fire for it. And I almost committed suicide that night with pills and alcohol. And wow. so that was a lesson to me in the power of uh, really words, you know, the, the power that words have that one man gave me my dream. Literally, I would not be here without that man telling me why not be happy between here and here. Mm-hmm. And the other man, I almost committed suicide that night. So, and, but it ended up working out that he strengthened my resolve. I did not kill myself. And I thought of that guy in an unhealthy fashion every single day when people were like, hey, you want to go out to a restaurant? Hey, you want to go to the mall? Hey, you want to go to a party? You want to go out drinking, go to a bar? I was like, nope, I got something to do, man. And I thought of that guy every day and I ended up getting straight A's, getting into Chapel Hill, you know, giving that guy the middle finger on the way out and feeling great about it. And, uh, and I was on my way But about halfway through my uh, master's at Chapel Hill, where I was, again, driving very hard, working 80 hours a week between working at GNC's now, doing a lot of online work with these supplement companies, you know, message boards and all those things, and then helping tutor students in the sciences and also working on my master's itself, I ended up getting very sick. I got Epstein-Barr virus fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, Hashimoto's, my whole body was shutting down. And I was stuck in bed for six months in pain, inflamed, thinking I was going to die again, considering suicide, because again, my dream seemed like it was over. I didn't Mm -hmm. think I'd be a productive member of society, let alone a formulator. And I ended up looking at these online message boards and stumbling into keto. And that's when I started doing keto over 20 years ago. And it ended up getting me out of bed, reducing my pain and inflammation and getting me back into school again. And my life came back to me. And since then, I've, I've kept to keto pretty, pretty consistently. And then I shifted from sports nutrition supplements to then immunity and longevity. And that's when my life really started to shift in that direction. Mm-hmm. And And then about eight years ago, when I was working at Dymatize as a formulator, finally, I was working at my dream job after working about 10 years clinically as a chief clinical dietitian. I got got my big break at Dymatize, which is a a global uh, sports nutrition company. And I was formulating full-time director of R&D. We ended up selling the company for 425 million. It's a huge company. Wow. But... I ended up getting sick there too, because they wanted to sell the company and they wanted me to work 80 hours a week. I was working 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. every day. And uh, I got a brain tumor. And 
again, like that was like my body as the wake up call. And that's when I started digging more into like self-care, you know, with, with uh, daily affirmations and gratitude and, you know, who do I have around me? And, you know, I was reading uh, and listening to Tim Ferriss and some of these people and Ben Greenfield at the time. And mm -hmm. I actually got on Ben Greenfield's show way, way back then. And, uh, and that's when like things really changed for me. And I started really evaluating not just biohacking to try and fix myself because I was so broken. I always believed I was just broken badly. And that's where all this, you know, passion came from with the diet, with nutrition, with exercise, with supplements, with all the hacks. I was hacking into my broken self to try and fix it all because I never really loved myself or cared about myself. So there was no solid foundation. It was like me trying to fix the car while I was going 80 miles an hour down the road. Yeah. But it was about last year when I was working on this book and maybe even as much as two years ago when I took a trip to Iceland with Kayla, who's a good friend of mine and you know very well, mm -hmm. uh, that I started really shifting. Like I spent two weeks in Iceland with like my phone. I lost my, I broke my phone and then lost it. And I wasn't able to get online mm -hmm. and I had massive shifts. There's no EMF. And I was just jumping in ice cold lakes and doing the hot tubs and then connecting with incredible people and fostering really deep relationships that started shifting me. And then my friend Keith Norris said of paleo FX told me, Hey, come on to this plant medicine journey. And I was like, nice. up until then, I always thought it was just drugs and druggies and crazy people. Yeah. And I was like, okay, Keith, like, I love you. I believe you. Let me do this. And that was the first time I felt a massive shift in me being able to love myself and have groundedness, be parasympathetic and not just sympathetic and ultra sympathetic with hustle and grind. <laughs> Right. Instead of just hustle and grind, I was like, hey, there's hustle and flow here. I can get into a flow state. I can love myself. I can be a master of my craft. Because up until then, despite all my initials, all my accomplishments, everything I've ever done, I believe that I was just trying to level up, get into the bigger room, the better room, get into the, the around the better people, get on the, the next show. I, I was on Ben Greenfield. Let me get on to Joe Rogan. You know, I've got this level house. I need to get that level house. I'm in this mastermind. I need to get in the bigger mastermind. So I'm going to prove myself because at that point, that's when they'll love me. That's when they'll acknowledge me mm -hmm. because I've been hurting my whole life emotionally. So long story short, <laughs> yeah. it really took a lifetime of working on all these things kind of maybe backwards and falling into what should be my foundation towards the end, but I'm so proud of me working so hard and having all those sicknesses and diseases so that I could have the empathy and compassion. And it gave me the passion to be where I am and to become the best in my field. And so mm -hmm. I have no regrets about it, but now I'm in a very different place where I do want some peace of mind, where I do want self-love. And so the book runs the balance. I have all the hacks for sure, but I also have a lot about community and self-love and affirmations and breath work and gratitude and, and, you know, what it takes in blue zones to, to have that uh, connection and, and how loneliness and isolation is, is hurting us. And, you know, it, it runs the gamut, you know, I talk yeah. about cold plunges, but I also get into a little woo stuff too. So yeah. uh, I'm really proud of the balance of it. And that's my, that's my story and how I got here. Absolutely, man. I love the book. I've been reading it for the last day or so. And, you know, when I first met you, and I haven't said this to you ever in any domain, but when I first met you, it was, I believe, two or three years ago, 2019, I think, at Paleo FX, and I saw you speak on stage, and I was like, who is this handsome feller? What's he going to talk about? I want to listen to what he has to say. And you were dynamic on stage, you were confident, and you were talking about nootropics. And I was like, man, he's so far beyond like what I want to be, right? I respect this man. But little did I know at that point what you'd been through and even what you were going through, even at that point when I perceived you as this uber successful, handsome, good looking, got everything, you were still going through stuff in your life. And that is what it's so crazy. And, you know, out of a lot of the health influencers that I know, I don't know them all, but 
your story, I think, is the most compelling, Sean, because at every turn, you've been given a bad hand, every turn, and you've turned it around, and you've turned it around, and you've turned it around, and I respect where you are, man, so I just want you to know that uh, what you've done is it truly sets the stage for others to follow behind you and be inspired by what you're doing, so keep up the good work. That's now- a lot for us, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, let's touch on the new book which again, it's more of a guidepost to a, a successful life than just reading a book about energy. But you've got, you've broken it into six different chapters or pillars, if you may, where you talk about some of the core concepts that we're gonna unpack in this interview. So as we get started, Sean, can you just very briefly touch on what the core six concepts are before I start teasing out some of these other questions? Yeah, yeah, so it is uh, it is uh, an acronym for energy, right? So it's experiment. So I get into the idea of biohacking, bioindividuality, epigenetics, blood work, and really exploring what makes you unique and understanding what can work for you. Before we talk about all the hacks in the following chapters, you need to know that not everything's going to work for you. And you need to know how to assess that and how to put these pieces together. And so that's what that chapter is about. And then I get into nutrition, covering keto, paleo, Mediterranean, carnivore, vegan, and how important it is to really just focus on whole food. But I get into how to execute all those. Like I said, I'm, I'm a keto paleo person for sure. Exercise, I get into high intensity interval training and all the hacks, why high intensity interval training is so much better than low intensity, steady state, traditional aerobic exercise and different concepts like blood flow restriction and intraset stretching and how to get much more out of your time at the gym. Then routines, and that looks at circadian rhythm and the sleep-wake cycle and, and a dialed morning routine and what that can mean to your day, how you can literally own your day. And then at the other end of it, building a sleep fortress and having good sleep hygiene and what that means to your health and all the devices and apps and hacks and all the things to do on that front. Then going into growth, uh, there's growth mindset like stoicism, the obstacle is the way, uh, get into fasting, both intermittent and extended and the benefits there for growth mindset and resiliency, uh, and also nootropics. And then lastly, it gets into your tribe and that connection that's so important in these blue zones and how community is so important and mentorship, both being mentored and and being a mentee or, or, or mentoring, sorry, and how important that is, and then putting it all together. Uh, and then this book has these formulators corners where I get into all the supplements, resource hacks, it covers like the apps and the devices and the techniques. Uh, there's surveys in each chapter to assess your baseline and your progress. Um, there's over 60 full color diagrams. There's over hundred scientific citations. This thing's chock full, and I'm very proud that I'm putting it out there as an ebook for 99 cents as a pre-sale, and it also comes with a fasting for energy guide that's over 20 pages that gets into how to fast correctly and what your fasting type is, and then I have a whole hidden chapter on natural movement, and you get all that for a buck, <laughs> and it's really just me. It's, it's a pure passion project because I have almost died many times. I have almost killed myself many times. And this is about my passion. And I literally have rewrote this book several times because of my changes in evolution. Mm -hmm. I've been in the plant medicine space and had epiphanies. I had this book recorded in LA. Wow. And I went back and re-recorded it. And that cost me um, another 10 grand. And so I put a lot of money and passion and time into this. But now I'm so proud of where it is, and it's such a, a masterpiece to me, and I think it's going to change lives. Absolutely. Anybody that reads the book is going to realize that, and I encourage everybody, go to energyformula.com, get Sean's book, go to Amazon, get the pre-sale. It is a fast, fascinating, fantastic book. So let's dive in. And before I do, actually, I do want to comment on your resource hacks uh, and you know some of the, I guess, not the quizzes, but... Um, what do you call those in after every section where you have where people can grade themselves on yes, uh, how they're doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, sir. 
the surveys. And so that that's a very good tool because you can see how others will compare to you, what the different options are. And then you, at the end, you can say, well, I'm doing, I'm in the middle of the range or I'm really at the top. I just need to tweak something. So let me go find those tips or hacks. But uh, the resource section, uh, the resource hacks, if you will, they've got all kinds of links, not links, but like you give specific guidance to here's the supplement that I use. Here's the brand that I use. Right. So I loved that because it's so specific, you know, well, exactly what to do. And along those lines, I don't take any affiliate money whatsoever. So everything that I mentioned in that book is literally stuff I'm proud of. I've used, I believe in, and I wanted people to know that like that I've never taken money and none of these opinions are biased. Like this is literally the stuff I use. That makes it even more legit, Sean. Okay, let's dive into, we cannot talk about energy without discussing the powerhouses of the cell in our bodies, which are the mitochondria. Um, let's do a super quick 30 second geeky tour of what happens to how energy is generated basically. So when, from the time we open our mouth to eat that yummy, you know, Frito-Lay or, you know, whatever, the paleo baked potato, the yams, uh, piece of cheese or pizza, what happens and how does it actually translate to energy inside our bodies to the ATP? Yeah, exactly. So the mitochondria, like you said, are the, the powerhouse of the cell. You might remember from, uh, I don't know, middle school biology, maybe. Uh, but interestingly, people think there's typically one mitochondria in the cell and you have very energy dependent cells that can have up to 5,000, like in the heart. Um, so it's, it's actually really fascinating to look at these more energy dependent cells. Another place to look, a great area of research is brown adipose tissue. They're actually brown because they're so mitochondrial dense. And so the mitochondria, you might remember the Krebs cycle and you know what, you, what you're producing uh, is ATP along that cycle. Um, and typically we're using glucose for fuel uh, the problem and the rest of the world does fairly great with carbohydrate and doing glucose for fuel. Why don't we, I just want to do a little aside there. Uh, it's because of our metabolic syndrome. It's because of our, uh, our insulin resistance. It's because of our adiposity and it's because we are eating too much too often. We're not exercising enough. We're sedentary. We don't have uh, periods of time that we're not eating, call it, you know, it used to be called starving. Now we call it fasting, but food is so available with Grubhub and Uber Eats and vending machines and convenience stores and restaurants and snacks. And we're eating all day, every day. And we no longer eat whole food, we eat processed food, and it's high bliss point food that's engineered to make us overeat, override satiety, and have food gasms in your brain. And if you and, and we don't have resistant starch like was common in whole foods with carbohydrates, and we don't have fiber that was common in carbohydrates. So you add all this stuff up back in the paleo days when they were eating. Yes, high carb quite often, maybe not through the winter. Maybe they were more strict ketogenic then when they were just finding, when they were fasting and finding woolly mammoths and whatever. But during the summer, spring, whatever, yes, those might've been higher carb, but it's a very different equation than it is now. And I believe that at least 50% of the time we would have been in ketosis. So all that said, if you look at the rest of the world, they might eat one meal a day. They don't eat copious amounts of processed carbohydrates or processed food. They, they have more exercise or man, manual labor. And so all of this is a very different equation. So when we look at us, uh, that's why the ketogenic diet, I'm, I'm very passionate about it for people that have metabolic syndrome, metabolic dysfunction, mitochondrial dysfunction, where they're not able to make enough energy in that crank. We're insulin resistant. We're glucose intolerant and glucose is just hanging around at too high a level and isn't going into the cell through that GLUT4 translocation to make that ATP, adenosine triphosphate, the energy currency in your body. 
And so we run into insufficient cellular energy states, ice, or in the brain, it's a term called brain energy gap. But either way, it's a shortfall of energy. And what then happens is you get chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, hypertonic muscles, you get diseases, higher, higher propensity for all disease states. And then you get, uh, you, you also get a, a lack of real experiential energy. And this is a true problem. And then when you give someone the ketogenic diet or let them get adapted to fasting or exogenous ketones or get them uh, glycogen depleting exercise and all these different things and they get ketones elevated, then all of a sudden the lights come back on and they're getting that fuel source and they're no longer in an insufficient cellular energy state. And they're no longer in a state of chronic glycation, inflammation, and oxidation. And so it's a very different scenario. And that's what I go through in this book is ways to turn that energy back on, turn the lights back on, have you feel that vitality again. Because so many people don't even realize how much pain and inflammation and fatigue and disease they're heading towards and why. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to your point, right, it's the, the blood glucose that we so need to get into our cells. We have plenty of it because we're eating these bliss foods, the foodgasms. We have blood glucose in the, in the blood, but we can't shuttle it to our cells. And the cells are starving, but we have ample energy, supposed energy in our body that we can't even use, which is the biggest irony of this all, of the food that we're eating. So in your book, Sean, you talk about the fact that 95% of energy in our body is created by the mitochondria. And we know that there are certain factors that can damage the mitochondria outside of what we just discussed with, you know, eating the wrong kinds of foods or too many carbs. What might be some of these factors that are damaging to the mitochondria so we can avoid uh, exposing ourselves to these things? Yeah. So again, uh, one of the big ones is going to be that uh, excess glucose uh, which is going to keep insulin elevated in, in those scenarios. And then that leads to the, the oxidative stress that leads to uh, the glycation, the blood sugar damage that leads to the inflammation chronically. All these things are okay when they're acute, like inflammation's okay to signal like we need some healing or uh, some uh, immune response here. Um, and like blood sugar obviously is okay to go up sometimes when, and then there's an insulin response and it drives it into the cell and then you make energy. That's cool. And oxidation is a signal too. And there's the redox, the reduction and oxidation that, that happens that's natural, but at all these things, uh, it's, it's a cycle of like, it damages the mitochondria and then damage mitochondria do this. So it's like a kind of a downward spiral of mitochondrial dysfunction and less energy and more mitochondrial dysfunction and less energy. And you run into these insufficient cellular energy states that are going to lead to more mitochondrial dysfunction because they're overworking, mm -hmm. right? You have less mitochondria because you're not, when you're in a healthy state, you can, you can do mitochondrial biogenesis from these hormetic stressors where you make more mitochondria when you do the ketogenic diet when you do fasting, when you do the cold plunge, when you get more sleep, when you do high intensity interval training, you make more mitochondria and they function at a higher level. But when you're not doing these things and you're in insufficient cellular energy states, there's less mitochondria and they're working less optimally and they're overworking and you're creating more damage and more disease and it's just a downward spiral. And of course, eating junk food is a problem. And things that are, uh, there's something that I don't get into in the book, but is deuterium can be a problem. This heavy hydrogen, it's kind of like the fat guy through the turnstile, if you will, that it doesn't go through, gets stuck and wreaks havoc. And it's, you know, in some of the uh, less clean waters, we'll say, in also some of the, um, the junk food uh, less clean air, we get like more deuterium. And so that can be problematic and that builds up and gums up the work, so to speak. And then not getting these xenohormetics. So from plants, 
in particular, what protects plants uh, from sun damage, from not getting enough um, uh, oxygen, not getting enough moisture in. They have these polyphenols that protect them. And so that's one reason why you might want like a wine from a more arid area, from a, a harsher climate, because it's tougher, it's harder to kill because the polyphenols are higher. Those are xenohormetics. And so that resveratrol counts actually much higher in those tougher grapes. And, and so consuming polyphenols is another thing you see in common. Like I would say the first thing that's, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here with like the blue zones, but the first and most important thing is that community, is that connection, is that sense of purpose as you age with the super centenarians. But the second thing I would say, and probably the thing people have trying to been focusing on too much is the, is the diet and what they're consuming. But more importantly, I'm seeing polyphenols be a consistent thread through a lot of these cultures. So there's EGCG in green tea, there's resveratrol in red wine, there's quercetin in apples and onions, there's uh, apigenin in parsley, there's all these chlorogenic acid and, and coffee. And, you know, you've, you've probably heard about a lot of these things, terostilbene and blueberries. These compounds are so powerful at increasing NAD levels, at allowing for greater sirtuin gene activity. They're caloric restriction mimetics. So therefore they are hormetic and allow you to be tougher and allow you to create more energy and be more resilient. One of the keys I talk about in the book is resiliency. That's the through line in the book is being harder to kill. We have a bucket called the allostatic load in our body. It's the stress bucket and your bucket can be tiny or it can be large. You can grow that bucket and you can shrink that bucket. When the bucket is large, that's when you're tough and you're hard to kill. And that's how we used to be because we used to fast. We used to exercise. We used to be exposed to cold and hot and, and have adversity that made us stronger. And now we run from adversity and we're surprised about how easy we are to kill, how easily we get disease and run into issues with energy. And so that's like a big through line is finding ways to be more resilient and that keeps your energy up, that keeps that sirtuin gene activity there that's associated with anti-aging, that keeps the NAD levels up, keeps your mitochondrial uh, activity higher and more biogenesis. There's a common through line here that you see over and over and over. And that's, uh, I guess that's my answer. Now that's fascinating. I've, I think that polyphenols are my number one food source or like the compounds that I want to take on the day-to-day -day diet. They're, as you said, they're helpful as antioxidants. They're also part of the epigenetic diet, which help delay some of the methylation markers of aging and thereby slow your, uh, you know, age as measured by methylation tests or epigenetic age. So there's just tons of, of benefits of taking polyphenols every day in your diet. And I take multiple of these. So I agree. And uh, we'll come to the blue zones because I have a couple of questions on that for you. Uh, in terms of before we move on from supplements or mitochondria, I should say, Sean, uh, I can't let you go without asking you what are the top two or three supplements that you would recommend that improve either mitochondrial number, biogenesis, or the efficiency of the mitochondria? Well, directly around mitochondrial health, I would look at CoQ10 in the, in the ubiquinol, the reduced form. Um, I would also look at PQQ. Um, there is MitoQ. I don't know much about the quality of research there. It's interesting. Maybe we'll see more research. It's worth exploring. Uh, ways to increase NAD directly, that NAD to NADH ratio is pretty critical with anti-aging. The best way is going to be IV. Maybe the second best way that gets discussed very uh, little is intranasal, but you have to look at the dose you're getting and then how you're actually spraying there's some complexity to that. And then the next would be oral supplements, but niagen, NR, nicotinamide, riboside is really equivocal at best. I really don't like the data there. 
one step closer and what David Sinclair is a big fan of and Rhonda Patrick and people that are actually brilliant, not getting paid for it, are, uh, is NMN, uh, uh, nicotinamide mononucleotide. And so that's the one that I prefer, but people are dosing it probably too low. If you extrapolate the animal data body surface area, you're probably looking at more like uh, a gram to a gram and a half a day. So, and that gets expensive, just FYI. Um, so I'm a big fan of that. And then again, going back to these polyphenols being these uh, caloric restriction mimetics and, and activating cert genes, et cetera. My two favorite, there was a study where they looked at all the polyphenols and fisetin that comes from strawberries was the top. Hmm. That's the best one that they, that they showed. And so I like that one to raise NAD. And then on the flip side of, of uh, NAD depletion is CD38, an enzyme that breaks down NAD. So as we age, we make less NAD and we break it down faster. It's like a double whammy of suckness from aging. Mm -hmm. So we want to find ways to increase NAD like NMN or intranasal NAD or IV NAD and, and certainly this uh, like quercetin or, or I like fisetin a lot. Mm -hmm. And then on the flip side, we want to find ways to inhibit CD38, which is also called NADAs, an enzyme that breaks it down. So that one, my favorite one that I've seen the data on is apigenin that comes mm -hmm. from parsley. So I love that combination of uh, fisetin and apigenin. That's where the data is at right now. We may find there's actually like 500 plus polyphenols. So I don't know conclusively what the best one is out there, but per the data we have, those are some of the best ones. Uh, so those would be my recommendations. And then I also like dealing with some of this, these types of damage that I was talking about, like glycation specifically, I like dihydroberberine. I'm involved in a patent on that one. It's about five times more bioavailable than berberine and lasts about twice as long in the plasma. You don't get the GI distress. And so it's an optimized form of berberine. And berberine is a glucose disposal agent. It's going to lower advanced glycation end products. And then uh, lastly, I would look at um, inflammation with something like, I've actually come up with an optimized version of curcumin called tetrahydrocurcumin. Um, so those would be some things that I would look at. Uh, and then lastly, maybe I'll throw in adaptogens because that's that through line of resilience that allows you for greater allostatic load and resilience with that stress bucket. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's U stress on one side of that bell curve. And then in the middle, you have the Goldilocks zone, that perfect amount of stress. And then on the other side of that bell curve is distress where it's too much. Mm -hmm the adaptogens are going to help you normalize, help you grow your stress bucket, help you stay more in that Goldilocks zone. So those are things like ashwagandha and rhodiola and uh, ginseng and schizandra, et cetera. But ashwagandha and rhodiola are probably my two favorite. Okay, fantastic. That was a lot of examples you gave us. So let's go through that real quick to summarize for the audience. You said, uh, look at PQQ, some form of PQQ for mitochondrial help. Uh, look at CoQ10 because that's involved in the Krebs cycle. Um, consider polyphenols. Your two favorite are fisetin, uh, fisetin uh, plus apigenin. That yeah. combination helps increase NAD levels, which NAD is, again, it's such a cool molecule that we've learned about recently and not so distant past, but it's so fascinating because it's involved in so many of these enzymatic processes in the body, as you mentioned, uh, in the energy creation, but also when your DNA, get, DNA gets attacked, uh, your sirtuin genes need to repair the DNA and they break down NAD molecules to do that. Um, and then it's also a cofactor just for sirtuins in general. So a lot of benefits for NAD and uh, you should have enough, we should have enough NAD as we grow older, not less, which is what happens with aging. Uh, and then the other two you touched on, Sean, were dihydroberberine, which uh, you know I've heard from you before, as well as a new form of curcumin that you are patenting. But if people can't take that, then just look at curcumin an available form of curcumin, bioavailable form. Fair? You nailed it. You got it okay. all. Okay. Thank you. I was reading your book. Uh, all right. So let's talk about, and you also touched on, by the way, the best form of NAD. So you actually went to my next question, which is how do you get it? A lot of folks 
are doing IVs. I, they are expensive. We have to uh, acknowledge that, but it seems that they're the most effective forms of getting it into your bloodstream. Uh, the second one you mentioned was actually intranasal, but data is still, uh, we're not sure how good the data might be there. And then if you're looking at supplementation, NMN, in your opinion, is better than NR. And yeah. I, I, I think we use- Sorry, with intranasal? Yeah. I think it has a lot of potential. I really do. Mm -hmm. But I think the problem is you've got ones that are 50 bucks and 500 bucks. And like, so the, there's a massive dose difference, mm -hmm. not just, oh, intranasal NAD, how much are you getting per spray? And there's a big cost difference there. And then, like I said, like maybe how much mucus you have in your nose, how you're breathing in, are you holding one nostril? How long is it staying in there? All that stuff is a factor. So you might want to like read up on how to do it properly and buy a good one and give it a try. I have had friends that have had really good results with it, but I think I've also known people that have bought it and got no results. So it's a little complicated. Yeah. And of course, the older you are, the more NAD you're going to need. If you're 35, then you probably don't need as much as a 55 year old. Right. Uh, and I've started taking NR, which we talked about, Sean, I'm taking about 300 milligrams per day. But now I'm going to go back and evaluate if that's the right form and how much should I be taking? Of course, it's going to raise expenses, but it, it is what it is, right? Dump the NR. <laughs> dump the NR. I'm just flat out telling you dump the NR, but okay. okay. All right. When my supplement ends, I will not get NR again. Uh, okay, let's move on. I've got a very interesting question in terms of testing of mitochondrial function and health. And you've listed out multiple tests, but at least three in terms of OxLDL, HbA1c, and the CRP test. For the folks that don't know what these are, can you just briefly explain how they measure mitochondrial health? Sure, like I was saying, it's that downward spiral that we see with insufficient cellular energy, with insulin resistance, with mitochondrial dysfunction, with metabolic dysfunction, we see glycation, inflammation, oxidation go out of control. And you can also probably look at methylation too, but. I thought it made sense, and I haven't heard anyone say this besides me, that for a hundred, 200 bucks, maybe like once or twice a year, if we were looking at this proactively, we could really be ahead of all disease practically and biological over chronological aging, mm -hmm. but we're not looking at them. And yeah, you can do the epigenetic methylation test that you're talking about, that's far more complicated. What I'm talking about is a simple blood test but I, I believe you could get all three of these for probably about a hundred bucks. And yeah. if doctors were looking at these, they could say, whoa, hemoglobin A1C is elevated. Like we can get, a, get ahead of the metabolic dysfunction, the syndrome that's coming or the inflammation. Why is inflammation high here? Like, uh, like, is it a disease state? Are you under chronic stress? Let's talk about that. Like maybe you're dealing with depression. Maybe you're going through a divorce. Maybe like, you know, there's, you just lost your job or you're chronically using alcohol. Like why is, why is this elevated? You know, but we're not looking at those. And yes, you could look at a hundred labs and I, I could list out 20 labs that are great, but I really feel strongly that if we're looking at these three and oxidized LDL for oxidation, mm -hmm. that that would be profound in terms of the impact on our health as a, as a country and as a world that we could really be proactive. And it frustrates me that we only look at hemoglobin A1C when you're diabetic. We only look at CRP once you've had a heart attack. So it's super yeah. frustrating to me. Yeah, it's a shame. It's a shame. And it goes back to some of the top reasons why people are aging faster, which is high inflammation, oxidation, and glycation that's running rampant in their bodies. Uh, okay, let's, we've only touched on the first pillar and we're like, you know, 30 or 40 minutes in. So I'll, I'll make it quick, Sean, but uh, I want to just skirt with nutrition. Uh, I don't want to go deep because this is almost a religious topic for some people. Uh, we know there's fans of all kinds of lifestyles. If, if I may, there's keto, paleo, certainly vegan, it's getting popularity. And then I'll, on the opposite I'll, end. I'll solve it right now. I'm going to solve okay, perfect. all the stage right now. So how should we think about uh, nutrition for an energetic lifestyle is my question. The most important thing, and before you even think of keto, is to eat whole food. Mm -hmm. We argue about vegan or paleo, what worked. You can eat uh, or, or carnivore or all these different things or keto. 
let's say with with vegan you could eat coca-cola and gummy bears and you could be vegan you could have carnivore and be eating hot dogs and spam you could have keto and be eating keto treats and desserts and all kinds of crap and you could be eating paleo and have molasses and honey and all these things all like make your treats as well (laughs) the key is to eat whole food and move your body and i believe that like if you're eating whole food whether it is vegan or carnivore or anything in between you're way better off than 95 percent of the people out there then you can get into Is it well constructed? And, you know, let's talk about different nutrients and what's optimized for your body, for your lifestyle. I mean, the only diet that really matters, and I hate the word diet, is a diet that you are consistent with, that you create as a lifestyle, that you have full compliance with, that you're not frustrated by, that you're not going to do for eight to 12 weeks and stop, that you're going to do for the rest of your life. And I get very frustrated with the keto police, the fasting police, the paleo police, that that's not, wait, you're having Splenda and you're, you're supposed to be paleo. You're having a, uh, you know, a dessert and you're supposed to be keto. Like what, what's that pizza? You're supposed to be keto. Wait, you're having bone broth. That's not real fasting. All these people, like we should be lifting each other up and realizing our journey. And it matters what works for you. And you don't need to be correct or militant 100% of the time. That's not even healthy. Like I do cyclical and targeted ketogenic dieting. I have two meals a week where I have whatever I want because that helps me. And if you think about uh, with a diet, if I have one salad a week, but I eat McDonald's all my other meals, am I going to be healthy? No, but the reverse is true too. If I eat healthy, all week long and then I have one or two meals that that aren't or I have Splenda or I have bone broth or I have whatever it is that you think isn't allowed it's not really going to be a factor so stop beating other people down and let them live their lives and lift them up and support them and if someone's drinking a coca-cola and they're on keto but they've lost a hundred pounds and they used to drink six cokes a day Say, great job, brother. Enjoy that freaking Coke. That's what I say. Yeah. Love it. I think your focus on, ad, on whole foods is, is great. It's, it's too, this topic is just, it's too crazy. People get too religious about it and there's no reason to. All right, let's, let's keep moving then. Uh, exercise or movement as part of your, one of the chapters, one of the key pillars of this energy formula. And the benefits of exercise, as we know, are tremendous, immense. Like talk about fat loss, muscle gain, which means better body composition, which means you look better naked. From an anti-aging perspective, it improves blood flow, improves mitochondria in your cells, improves the efficiency of the mitochondria, improves glucose shuttling that we were talking about earlier, increases BDNF, which at least protects your brain neurons and may even grow some, which is fascinating. Uh, And I'm barely scratching the surface. So from an energetic standpoint, Sean, how do you approach exercise and what are the different types of exercise people should be considering or thinking about? I mean, it's as simple and it's almost cliche as the body in motion stays in motion. And then when we're not in motion, we atrophy because the body says we don't need it. And it's kind of like when you stop eating that food, the body stops making the enzymes for it. So you want a better, more vibrant life and vibrancy involves moving then you need to move that body and use that body so that you maintain it with age. And we see like, you've talked about this on a a show not too long ago on Clubhouse, which follow Faraz on Clubhouse, follow me on Clubhouse as well, at biohacking. There we go. (laughs) Uh, Grip strength, right? Like grip strength is like one of the number one predictors of longevity as we age because it's so critical. And I worked in a nursing home. I've seen people that were 55 years old, break a hip, you know? And then I've seen people that were 90 that were still running five plus miles a day. And I was like, wow, there's like huge differences here. Mm -hmm. And it was how well they were moving their body. I feel like that actually uh, is even more important than the nutrition aspect. Obviously it's great to have both, but uh, moving your body is so critical. And in the book, I get into high intensity interval training and how in just 
five to 10 minutes, you can do far more in just a couple times per week than someone who's, you know, working out for an hour or an hour and a half, especially if they're doing mostly cardio. Because we make those adaptations when we're hitting our peak threshold, when we're near maximum, that's when the body says, whoa, 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 we need to change things up here. We need to adapt. We need to grow stronger. We need to become more resilient. We need more muscle. We need more innervation to this muscle. We need more recruitment. We need to have better uh, awareness of our body in space and how that works with the brain. We need more neuroplasticity. We need more VO2 max. How do we do this? How do we handle this stress? That only happens when you're at 90, 95, 100% threshold. It's not going to happen at two hours of 40 to 50% threshold. Yeah, you may be moving your body and burning calories, but that's a very different equation. That's why very little work in the high intensity, it's difficult, but it's a lot less work if you do high intensity interval training. And then I get into some ideas, some cool hacks like blood flow restriction, where you put on these uh, uh, cuffs that you would use, like if you like tourniquet cuffs that you might use medically, like if you're bleeding out, basically like a strap, like a belt that you can put on, like say with your biceps or your quadriceps, and you put them onto what would be about a seven or eight out of 10 so that you're restricting uh, venous, not arterial blood flow. So it's literally just increasing cell swelling, similar to like what happens towards the end of your set when you're like, oh my God, I'm so pumped. I can't do another rep. That's starting right away. So you can actually deload. You can use a lot lower weights. You can train at 40% of one rep max versus 70, 80, 90% of one rep max and still get hypertrophy gains. So it's a very cool way to deload and still get great gains and adaptation. The last one I'll give is intraset stretching. And this is about complete time under tension. So think if you're doing a bicep curl and you're not bouncing at, at the top or the bottom and you have time under tension, a controlled rep, and you get to the end of your set and then you flex out your arms, you flex out your triceps as hard as you can. So now what happens when you flex out that tricep, your bicep is lengthened as much as possible. It's stretching. So that's more time under tension after you were just doing your set. So it never rests. And then you go back into your next set and you're more exhausted. Your muscle is more worked as a result. So you can use, you can stack some of these up if you want to really get some gains. Yeah. Uh, you can do supersets with intraset stretching and blood flow restriction, and then you're really getting into it. So those are some ideas that are that are helpful with with gains and and holding on to mass as you as you age. Mm -hmm. And that's so important because sarcopenia is real and we see the difference in stature. We see the difference in muscle mass and you, you've worked at a, at a nursing home, I believe. Is that right? Yes. Before? Correct. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so you see what happens. I went to uh, the aging, I participated in an aging study in out of uh, Maryland that's funded by the NIA and there's all ages of people there. And I met an 80 year old there and he said, Oh, you're the young buck coming in. I said, I guess compared to you, sir, I might be younger, but I seek your wisdom. Um, so it's, it's very interesting uh, that muscle is, is so important for us. And you said, uh, after this interview, I'm actually going to the golf course near which I live and I'm doing some sprints outside. Um, mm -hmm. And it's easier for me to do sprints because I was a soccer player my whole life. I don't know that I'd recommend this to everybody because you want to have good uh, foot you know, pattern and make sure you don't fall on your face while you're doing this because that would derail your muscle building and, and your maximum intensity exercises. But uh, really good tips. Okay, let's move on. There's so much to dive into here. Um, and, you know, I'll just say one side note, Sean, when I do see people that look younger than their age, I will say this, it's all, I have this sensation or gut feeling in the back of my head that they must work out. They must be going to the gym. They must be doing something. And I almost always, when I ask them, you know, what's your secret? They're like, oh, I work out. It's almost always true, 95%. So exercise is doing just has a load of benefits and it shows up in time. Um, okay, let's go to the next one. You talk about circadian biology, circadian rhythms, and just having a routine. So there's two different things there. 
Um, why would you de define circadian rhythm as being important for energetic uh, energy creation in our body, I should say? It's the natural rhythm of our body. It's the sleep wake cycle. It's the sun moon cycle. It's the day night cycle. So our bodies were not nocturnal. We're meant to go with this rhythm over millions of years. We've evolved to do this. So as the sunlight goes, so does our energy. Uh, when the sun comes up, melatonin is blocked. When the sun goes down, melatonin starts to get released and we feel tired. This is the rhythm of all our, our hormones and neurotransmitters. There's something called an endocrine cascade where hormones beget more hormones and they affect each other. And so it's very important to realize uh, that we need to follow our biochemistry by following this circadian rhythm. And it's ideal that we wake up with the sun, that we do only eat during that uh, sunlight window or the, the, the daylight window uh, that Dr. Sachin Panda talks about. Like I like to do intermittent fasting. So I do like a, a 16 and eight where I don't eat for 16 hours and I have a, a feeding window of eight hours. And I do that between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. So that stays consistently in that daylight window year round. And so for me, that works. And because when you're eating nocturnally, when you're eating like after it's dark out at night, you're turning on your circadian rhythm. You're making it more difficult to fall asleep. Of course, your body is having to process all that. And of course, you can see that with your HRV and how that affects you, like your recovery and your stress levels when you're eating later. And then, of course, we're watching TV and getting the blue light and all the devices late at night, getting artificial uh, light that's abnormal, that we're not adapted for. And that's blocking melatonin and that's hurting our circadian rhythm and preventing us from getting better quality sleep and recovering better. And so all these things are, are, can be problematic. So going naturally with this rhythm and waking up with proper, uh, with a proper morning routine at the right time, and then having good sleep hygiene at night with that cool bed, with the, the lack of light in the room, possibly wearing a sleep mask and, um, you know, taking things like melatonin, magnesium, GABA, things I get into in the book. Um, you know, all of those things are going to help with your, your sleep hygiene, not watching TV in the bedroom, uh, not looking at your cell phone at night, not having arguments in the bedroom, not having uh, kids in the bedroom and playing in the bed, your office in the bedroom, all these different things. This is actually an office with a spare bedroom. Uh, so, you know, those things are important that when you think of your bedroom, you think of sleep. That's really important. And then in the morning, I'm so focused on creating that positive morning routine because when you look at like all successful people that Tim Ferriss uh, interviewed for Tools of Titans, they had two things in common. They had uh, that resilient reframing uh, experimenters mindset that we can get into in, on the next section. And they also had dialed morning routines. They owned their day. They didn't let the day own them. And that changes the whole shape of the day. And so just even five to 10 minutes I get into in the book, just five to 10 minutes of instead of eh, 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 and you wake up and you're like, oh my God, epinephrine, cortisol is going, I'm behind. I got to like get my coffee. I'm so tired. I didn't sleep well because I stayed up and watched Game of Thrones. I should have fell asleep. Like, God, I'm exhausted. And okay, like oh, I got to let the dog out. When's the dog going to come back in? This is taking too long. I'm late jump in my car, I'm weaving in and out of traffic, got the music up because I'm tired, I'm drinking my coffee. Now I got like a donut or a honey bun or something because I need some sugar because I'm exhausted and I'm stressed. And then I get to work. What's up, Joe? Oh man, I got so many emails. Um, how do I get through all these emails and just going down the rabbit hole and the day now owns me and it's 11 and I'm thinking like, when am I gonna go to lunch? I'm starving. What do we got for lunch? Like, where am I gonna go to eat? And then oh, like I come back from lunch exhausted because I ate carbs. I ate like a bunch of junk because I'm exhausted and couldn't make better decisions. And then I'm thinking I need something from the vending machine. I need some sugar. I don't know whether it's a Coke or some candy. And then I'm going home just exhausted and frustrated. I'm going to just plop out on the couch and I'm just going to watch something because today was hell. That started with your morning routine. 
And if you wake up with chimes slowly getting louder and slowly coming in a little faster, and you wake up with the light getting a little brighter from a lamp, and you uh, do some breath work as you start feeling more awake, you don't reach for your phone doing some box breathing or something like that, like eight seconds in, eight second hold, eight second out, eight second hold. Do that a few times and then do some gratitude. I'm so thankful that I have amazing people around me. I'm thankful that the sun is out today. I'm thankful that I woke up today. I'm thankful that I have a car. I'm thankful that my dog is licking my face and happy to see me. I'm so thankful for so many things. And then you go into daily affirmations where you say like, today is going to be an amazing day. Today is going to be incredible. Today I will have success. Today I'm going to meet somebody new and change their life. You do that kind of stuff and you will manifest it. It will become real. It sounds woo, but it's not. Because let me tell you, the inner critic is so negative all the time. And you're listening to that voice all the time. The person that's most harsh to you is you. If anyone talked to you like you talked to you, you wouldn't be their friend. And you're telling people, you're giving them the rules on how to treat you by how you treat yourself. You want better people around you? Treat yourself better. You want that amazing guy to walk through the door? Treat yourself better. It doesn't come from outside. It comes from how you treat you. And so having that that morning routine of just like I'm saying five to 10 minutes, I'm not even talking about cold plunges and, you know, a three mile walk and listening to podcasts and brain games. And, you know, Ben Greenfield puts a, you know, tube up his butt to do enemas and, and peptides and all these things. I'm just talking about five to 10 minutes. Yeah. Changes your day changes the tone of your day. Huge difference. I think, by the way, first of all, that diatribe you went on, Sean, I need to record that and send it to you. And please excuse my, uh, my smiling because I couldn't stop. I broke my frame because you just went off and you were looking sideways and you just went off. And this is the fastest I've heard you ever talk. So well done, my friend. But that's the reality of life. And uh, I think this was one of the questions that's coming later. Uh, but I'll ask it now since you brought it up, is that as biohackers, as people that are trying to optimize everything, we're using tools, technologies, NAD IVs, we're spending gazillions on supplements without fixing our sleep, without having strong relationships, without setting intention for the day. It's to me, that's you're wasting your money because your foundations are so rocky that all of this is going to provide you a marginal benefit instead of the full benefit that you could have. So that's what frustrates me a little bit about the community that we're in, about everybody trying to be the, the most elite biohacker is as long as your foundation is right, go, go do whatever you want. But if you're you know, talking about the new supplement spermidine while you got four hours of sleep last night, it doesn't make any sense. So true. This is so true. I feel so passionate about, and this, you're describing my life. I mean, that's what I did. I was biohacking for 20 years to try and survive I was doing the the hustle and grind of sympathetic, ultra sympathetic and pieces were heating up and breaking off like grinding. Like I was heads down. I wasn't enjoying my life or loving myself or proud of myself. And I was just doing the hacks to survive. Mm -hmm. I was going 80 miles an hour down the road, trying to fix the car. And that's not the way to do it. And, and certainly I think someone who has inner peace and self-love and great relationships, like you see in these blue zones that aren't taking supplements, that aren't doing NADIVs, that are living over a hundred years, obviously that's the better way. All these biohacks are cool, but it needs to be built on top of that. Because I know a lot of biohackers that are living 50, 60, 70 years, and they're not super centenarians. Right. Okay. So let's touch on, you touched on blue zone. So I want to talk to you about the importance of community. And we've both been to a blue zone. I, I, I believe you've been to Sardinia multiple times, actually. And when I read your book, I learned about why you went to Sardinia is because you had an exchange student that came to stay with you that built a connection. So you've been there multiple times. And I, I went to Okinawa a couple of years ago just to kind of learn and see what the elders were doing. And, you know, when I was younger, Sean, I was all about, oh yeah, the bring on anything. I'm invincible. I can do anything, right? It's, I'm going to take, I'm going to make rash decisions, do risky things uh, without thinking about the consequences. But as you get around people that are older, much older, and they're wiser, they start to impart some of that wisdom to you. And you say, huh, I've never thought of things that way, but maybe I should. 
But coming back a little bit from wisdom and talking about community, what we know is that these blue zones have very, or people that live uh, to be centenarian and above have very strong communities uh, around them. People that take care of them, celebrate them even. In Okinawa, I interviewed a woman that was 97 years old and I asked her, so why do you wake up every morning? And she said, the town is going to celebrate me when I turn 100. I said, wow, what a fantastic way to go. The whole town is going to celebrate her. Uh, so what's your perspective on community, especially, I think you have an interesting perspective because you've been to a blue zone so many times. So I was someone that was keto and I was worried about going to Italy and my foreign exchange student said, you are not, I repeat, not going to eat keto and embarrass me there. And I was like, okay, like, all right, I understand. You know, obviously they eat their carbs. Mm -hmm. uh it's not as much carbs as you would think actually like especially in sardinia they they have a lot of meats and cheeses and very thin like kind of wafer breads and and certainly a heartier pasta that's a little different mm -hmm. but that said i was there for a couple weeks i was eating probably six thousand calories a day because these meals just would not stop. And they would be, you know, cause I was going to all these different people's homes or restaurants in the community. And they were like, I just wasn't aware that there was like 10 choruses and they would get frustrated if you wouldn't try it and have it and enjoy it. So I was doing all these meals where I was eating an insane amount of calories. And I ended up while I was there sleeping better, feeling better, breathing deeper, disconnecting from work, and I thought I was going to actually put on like 10 pounds from all these calories, all these carbs. And I lost weight after two weeks. Wow. And I realized that my, probably because my cortisol was lower, my HRV was higher and I was enjoying my time there. Like these meals were three hours, you know, that I'm fellowshipping, that I'm having red wine. And, and it's not just like people try and think, Oh, how much red wine? And to me, it's like, well, how, like, was it had with food? Was it, were you enjoying the company you were with? Like, are you sipping it over an hour? Like, like it's all a very different equation, like than just how much did you consume? And we tend to think of just pounding our alcohol. And, and for them, it's like something that's enjoyed with this parasympathetic experience. There's a psychosomatic response to food that you hardwire over time. With us, when we are weaving in and out of traffic, when we are getting food from the vending machine or watching sex and violence and Game of Thrones and when we're like doing all these different things that like when we have food, it's a stressful response. We're hardwiring that in. So even when we're not stressed and we have food, our body thinks it's stressful. And with them, they're so used to relaxing and enjoying food that whenever they have food, they look forward to it and it is relaxing. That's a psychosomatic response that becomes hardwired. And so it's a very different experience. And I took that away of like how critical that is. It's not about the, just about the food and wine, which is great. It's great food and wine, but it's more about the experience and the connection and the love and the therapy of opening up and feeling like you have people that you can count on and that care about you that's so different. And that's the piece we keep missing. And it's so critical. And that's what I literally made that the last chapter because isolation and loneliness is killing people globally, killing people. And the fear and the divisiveness is hurting us and lowering our immune systems and making us less resilient and weaker. And this community and the love and the connection and, and the great food and this experience is making them so much stronger and more resilient. And that's what we keep missing. Yeah, fascinating stuff. Like, as I said, I read your book once and I have to go back a couple of times and read it again. For the people listening, you should definitely go to energyformula.com and get Sean's book. Uh, it is, again, as I said, it's not just about energy. It's, it goes way deeper. It's almost a foundation for how to live an ideal life. So thanks for Sean for your hard work and the years of work really putting this together. Uh, where can, so people can find the book on energy formula, where else can they connect with you? Yeah, so energyformula.com for the book, Sean Wells for my personal website, S-H-A-W-N-W-E-L-L-S, seanwells.com. 
I have tons of free guides and awesome information there. Uh, things on fasting, on, on immune supplements, on my top supplements for anti-aging, all that stuff. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at Sean Wells, again, S-H-A-W-N. And on Clubhouse now, uh, at Biohacking, you can find me on Clubhouse. We're having fun over there. You can check out me and Faraz in a, in a bunch of anti-aging biohacking rooms. So yeah, that's how you can find me. And, and I really appreciate it. And it's so amazing to be on the show, Faraz. I love you, brother. Thank you, Sean. Likewise, my brother. I, I'm, I know this book is going to be awesomely successful and a lot of people uh, are going to drive a lot of benefit from it. So thank you again for putting the word, word out, the work in and inspiring a lot of people in the process. So thanks for coming on, Sean. Thanks, brother. See ya. 